Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, let's come to the Lord in prayer. Uh, gracious God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for another new day. In this Sunday, Lord, we can come together as a body of your people to worship you this morning, God. We remember who you are and what you have done for each one of us. And truly, Lord, we are thankful for the opportunity to even do so in this uh, virtual manner. And this morning, even for us at PJGH, God, we're reminded uh, of you, our Lord Jesus, as the light and the truth. God, indeed, we are so privileged uh, to be uh, called children of God. And we just want to continue to extend our thanks to you and that we pray that we have this privilege also to learn from your word. And uh, through this about Bible class every week, Lord, we are thankful that we are able to uh, start learning uh, about this doctrine of church. And uh, thank you for the weeks that have passed. And our brother Stephen has availed himself and his time to take us to the deeper understanding uh, of the church, uh, history of the church, the government, as well as the unity of the church Lord, that we have uh, done last week. So we just pray for um, the upcoming sessions, especially today, even as we look at the uh, practices as well as ordinances of the church in the form of our baptism, as well as Lord's Supper uh, uh, later, Lord, we just pray that again, you will uh, open uh, our hearts to have a deeper understanding and appreciation of our word to our, our dear brother. So we just commit this uh, time to you. We pray and ask all this, giving you thanks in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 Right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, we return to another session on <clears throat> the doctrine of church. And this time we're going to go into the practices of the church, uh, particularly on two topics, baptism and uh, the Lord's Supper. We'll begin with baptism, uh, part A. Next week we'll continue with part B. Um, now, Baptism, let's begin with, I'm sorry, biblical teaching on baptism. Now, we find the practice of baptism in the life and ministry of Jesus. Uh, we see in Matthew chapter 3, verses 13 to 17. Matthew chapter 3, verses 13 to 17. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for thus it is fitting uh, for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, uh, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. And it is this baptism um, um, process uh, or instance uh, event that, uh, that started Jesus' public ministry. Of course, that comes after uh, the testing in the wilderness. So jo Jesus himself uh, subjected himself to the baptism by John the Baptist. Not only was he personally baptized, he also had a ministry of baptism. We know this from John chapter 3. John chapter 3 verses 22 to 23 it says and after this jesus and his disciples went into the judean countryside and he remained there with them and was baptizing john also was baptizing at anon near salim because water was plentiful there and people were coming and being baptized so jesus and his disciples have this ministry of baptism chapter 4 verses 1 to 3 now when jesus learned that the pharisees had heard that jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than john although jesus himself did not baptize but only his disciples uh, so we have here, uh, Jesus was making more disciples and baptizing more disciples than John the Baptist himself. Uh, although Jesus himself did not baptize, uh, but only his disciples. So this is uh, the ministry of Jesus uh, as it concerns baptism. Now baptism, 
we find when Jesus rose uh, from the dead and before he ascended to heaven, he teach he taught his disciples in Matthew chapter twenty eight uh, verse eighteen. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. So uh, part of making disciples is to baptize them into uh, the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So it is some kind of an initiation rite, if you will, into the body of believers. Now, because it is an initiation rite, that is why it is, baptism is mostly associated with conversion, closely associated with uh, the act of conversion. Acts chapter 2, verse 37, for example, after uh, Paul preached his sermon on the day of Pentecost, and the, and the crowd, when the crowd heard this, they were cut to the heart. What did they hear? They hear that God has made Jesus both Lord and Christ, whom you crucified. So when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what, should, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So this is very closely associated with um, conversion. Verse 41 says, So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. So in those days, it would be unimaginable for a person to profess faith in Jesus Christ, but it is not uh, followed up by uh, baptism. Again, we see in Acts chapter 8, Acts chapter 8 verses 36 to 38. Uh, this is with Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. And uh, after preaching the gospel to uh, the Ethiopian eunuch, the Ethiopian eunuch, uh, and Paul uh, and uh, Philip were journeying together. Verse thirty six says, and as they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, "See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized?" Of course, that is rhetorical. Now, as a eunuch, he uh, could not worship in the temple or his full incorporation into the uh, body of God's people, uh, he, uh, he couldn't have that because uh, previously, in order to be fully incorporated into, initiated into God's people, you need to uh, convert to Judaism. And to do that, you will have to uh, be circumcised. And as a eunuch, uh, that cannot happen to him. But now he says, uh, who can stop me from being baptized? Which is to say that, uh, well, uh, nobody can stop me from being incorporated into God's people. All right. So that is what it means. Acts chapter 9 verses 17 to 19. This is about the conversion of Saul, Saul of Tarsus. And uh, he was blinded by his um, encounter with the Lord Jesus on the road to Damascus. And the Lord sent Ananias to him. So Ananias departed and entered the house. And laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized. And taking food, he was strengthened. Acts chapter 10, verse 45 to verses 45 to 48. This is the conversion of the first outright Gentile uh, believer in Jesus. This is the house of Cornelius. And uh, while Peter was still saying these things, uh, preaching the gospel. The Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And the believers 
from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. So this, in this particular case, the sequence is reversed. Uh, first they receive the Holy Spirit, then only, uh, and what and uh, how do they know that they have received the Holy Spirit? For they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter declared, Can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And that is the same rhetorical question uh, that, <coughs> the, uh, that the Ethiopian eunuch posed. Um, the Ethiop for the Ethiopian eunuch, he could not be incorporated into God's people because uh, he was a eunuch. He could not be circumcised. Uh, and there are verses in the Bible that would prevent him from being part of God's people. Um, likewise, here we have outright Gentiles, uncircumcised uh, Gentiles. So it turns out that baptism is not just for the Jews who have been waiting faithfully for the Messiah and upon the coming of the Messiah or upon the uh, announcement that the Messiah is uh, close at hand, do they repent and be baptized? But rather now we have uh, Gentiles also being baptized in, uh, uh, in the name of Jesus Christ. Verse 48 says, And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ and to show that these Gentiles uh, in the eyes of Peter, have been fully incorporated into God's people. We have the remainder of the verse. Then they asked him to remain for some days. So uh, that is the account that we have in Acts of the Apostles concerning uh, the association of baptism with uh, conversion. Paul also has uh, something to say about this particular uh, issue. Chapter 3 of the book of Galatians, verses 25 to 27. Uh, but now that faith has come, we are no longer under, under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. <coughs> there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for you are all one. In Christ Jesus. So, uh, for, for now faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian, for in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God. How? Through faith. And how do we indicate that faith? Uh, in close association to that faith, that conversion, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ, and the meaning of that baptism would be to put on Christ. And in this, and because uh, our um, uh, initiation into the body of God's people is baptism rather than something like circumcision, then there is neither Jew nor Greek. Uh, the Jew is circumcised, the Greek is not circumcised, uh, that is no longer um, uh, salient uh, to what it means to be God's people, uh, rather uh, both the Jewish person and the Greek person can receive baptism. There is neither slave nor free. So baptism is not just for uh, someone who is uh, free, but also uh, slaves. Uh, and there is no male and female. Baptism, uh, so, I'm sorry, circumcision was reserved only for males and not for females. But is, but now there is neither male nor female uh, because both can receive baptism for you are all one in Christ Jesus. So that is the biblical data concerning the close association of baptism with conversion. But what does baptism mean? And it is this particular um, uh, section that calls uh, a lot of discussion. Uh, Romans chapter 6 verses 1 to 6. Romans chapter 6 verses 1 to 6. Uh, Paul talks about uh, the meaning of baptism. 
What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him, in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. So, it is about identification with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Some say that uh, that is why we practice the uh, we practice baptism by immersion because it uh, best uh, symbolizes uh, uh, or, or uh, put into a picture uh, in a very clear way your death, <coughs> burial, and resurrection with uh, Jesus. You are identified with Christ. Colossians chapter 2 uh, verse 12 Colossians chapter 2, verse 12. So prior, he talks about circumcision. <clears throat> verse 11, he says, In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. I will repeat verse 12. Uh, you have been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through the faith in the powerful, through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. So uh, again, this is about the identification of the believer with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. First Peter chapter 3 and verse 21. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21. He says, uh, talking about Noah's ark and then the uh, water ca uh, came and then a uh, few were saved. Eight people uh, brought safely through water while the rest uh, perished. And then verse 21 says, Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. Right? What does baptism do? Baptism saves you not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let me repeat this much discussed verse. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And finally, <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 12 and verse uh, 13. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and are all were made to drink of one spirit. So we are all baptized into one body. So that is initiation of the believer into the church. So then we have the biblical teaching, the biblical data on baptism uh, of the life and ministry of Jesus himself and his own teaching, as well as the close association uh, that we can find in Acts and also in the writings of Paul about that of conversion with uh, that of baptism. And we talk also about uh, various meanings of baptism, that is to be identified with Jesus in his, uh, in his burial, in his death, in his burial, and in his resurrection. And it is also, it also means the salvation of the believers. It says that uh, baptism corresponding to this saves you, but not as 
uh, removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a clear conscience. And uh, finally, <coughs> initiation into the church baptism uh, um, makes you a member of the church of God, the body of Christ. So that is the biblical teaching. And as you can see, uh, it is subject to interpretation. And now we want to go into the interpretation of these uh, verses, or rather the um, interpretation of what these verses, the picture that these verses paint. All right. So with that, we want to go into um, uh, something very, very um, important to, to note <coughs> that you may not be familiar with. <coughs> now, some say that uh, baptism and um, the Lord's Supper are sacraments, <coughs> while others say that they are ordinances, right? Sacraments, ordinances. Now, I have heard that, I have heard people use these two terms interchangeably. Uh, they are not interchangeable. Uh, they do not mean the same thing. They are rather quite uh, different. Now, sacrament, uh, the basic meaning of sacrament is it is a means of grace. It is a rite of the church uh, that conveys divine grace or a means of grace to the adherents. How do you, it, it's a way to receive grace, okay? It is a channel of grace. Uh, so if you want to, enjoy the grace of God in your life, then the sacraments is a means of the church uh, that can convey divine grace to you. So that is what uh, sacrament means. Uh, in the Council of Florence, 1439, uh, the Roman Catholic Church uh, um, detailed <coughs> seven such sacraments. Uh, baptism, uh, that is for whether uh, adults or for for infants, <coughs> or rather for believers or for infants. Confirmation, that is if you were uh, baptized as an infant, then at a certain age, say 12 or 13, then you will go through the sacrament of confirmation. And then we have the Eucharist, which corresponds to the Lord's Supper. Uh, the Eucharist means thanksgiving, uh, which has a lot to do with sacrifice. And then we have penance, uh, that is also a sacrament. When you uh, committed a sin, you can do penance as a sacrament uh, in order to receive God's grace. Uh, marriage is a sacrament for the people. Ordination is a sacrament for the church. So marriage, a sacrament for the, for, for, for the people. Ordination, a sacrament for the priests. Um, which would require celibacy. And then, finally, there is the sacrament of extreme unction. Uh, sacrament of extreme unction is basically uh, 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 before one dies to receive God's grace to, uh, uh, to pass into, the, uh, into, into, into death uh, in a way that is commanded to God's grace, or rather to have God's grace conveyed to you before you die. So these are the <coughs> seven uh, sacraments uh, that, that, are, uh, that, that are detailed by the Roman Catholic Church. Now Protestants uh, would usually say there are only two sacraments, baptism and Holy Communion. Baptism and the Lord's Supper are the two uh, sacraments, whereas the Roman Catholic says that there are seven. Um, so Protestants who hold to uh, the sacramental view include Lutherans and uh, various forms of uh, reformed uh, um, denominations. <coughs> so that would include um, denominations that come from that line, um, including that of the um, Anglican Church and the Presbyterian Church and also the Methodist Church uh, and uh, other Reformed churches. 
as well as the Lutheran Church, they also hold to the sacramental view. That is, that uh, baptism and Holy Communion actually conveys grace as you partake of, of them. Now, conversely, we have <coughs> uh, ordinance. Ordinance uh, says that the Lord's Supper and baptism are not means of grace. Rather, they are evidence of grace that show that you have received grace. It is the evidence that you have received grace. So it is a rite of the church that demonstrates the reception of divine grace by the adherent. I will let these two definitions sit with you for a while so that you'll be able to tell the difference. A sacrament is a means of grace, a rite of the church that conveys divine grace to the adherent. That is, by receiving the sacraments, you are receiving grace from God. Uh, conversely, in an ordinance, it says that it is a demonstration that you have received grace. So because you have received grace and you want to demonstrate your reception of grace by participating in the ordinance. So the sacrament says you receive grace, the ordinance says you have received grace and you are now showing that you have received grace. So that is the difference. Um, so ex examples are the Baptists, Baptists, uh, Churches of Christ, Brethren Assemblies and uh, forms, various forms of Pentecostals would usually take the view of ordinance rather than the view of uh, sacrament. Right? So now, with that out of the way, we want to go into uh, both views. Uh, today, we are going to be looking at uh, two sacramental views, the Roman Catholic view of baptism as well as the uh, Lutheran view of uh, baptism. Uh, next week, we'll be looking at the Reformed view and also the Ordinance view. Now, right, so in, <coughs> in the sacramental view of, of uh, baptism, um, so some see baptism as means of saving grace. It is like baptismal regeneration. Regeneration have, uh, the waters of baptism regenerates you. It, it is the means of which you are saved. So, so it is baptism saves you, right? Uh, according to uh, 1 Peter. So there is the, Ro the Roman Catholics and the Lutherans. The Roman Catholic says that baptism is the means of infusing grace. So grace is infused into you in the waters of baptism. Um, and the Lutheran says that it is the means of grace in virtue of the word, that the waters of baptism become efficacious to communicate grace to you in virtue of it being bound up with the word or the formula that is uh, being used. So this is the, uh, for the Roman Catholics, it is the, 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 the waters of baptism has the power to give you grace, uh, whereas the Lutheran says, the waters of baptism have the power to give you grace because of the word of God. All right, so that is the slight difference between the two, but both of uh, these views see uh, baptism as means of saving grace. That is how you are saved. So let's move on to the Roman Catholic view. Um, the, for them, we're going to look at three matters. The meaning of baptism for Roman Catholics and who should be baptized, and also the mode of baptism. <clears throat> so we begin with the meaning of baptism according to Roman Catholicism. Baptismal regeneration. Baptism is a means by which God imparts saving grace that brings into effect the washing of regeneration. <clears throat> this is also known as baptismal regeneration ex opere operato. Uh, so, for example, Titus chapter 3 and verse 5, that, did we read Titus chapter 3 and verse 5 earlier? Uh, I think that we might not have. I will add that to the slide the next time. So, Titus chapter 3 
uh, verse 5, he says, He saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. So the argument here is that uh, washing here refers to baptism. Well, otherwise, with what do you wash? Clearly, you wash with water. So washing of regeneration. Uh, therefore, the, the, the washing itself, uh, baptism itself, is what uh, regenerates you. So that is according to the Roman Catholic view. Uh, John chapter 3 and verse 5 <coughs> says, John chapter 3 and verse 5 says, Truly, truly, I said to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So it is necessary for one to be born of water, and that is, uh, uh, that is interpreted to mean to be uh, born again through baptism. So the water here, according to the Roman Catholic tradition, it refers to baptism. And what would be uh, so the what would be the effects of baptism? Purification from sins and also a new birth in the Holy Spirit. So the grace of baptism is for is to bring about two principal effects. Uh, namely, purification from sins and new birth in the Holy Spirit. That your sins are washed away when you are baptized and you are regenerated by the Holy Spirit uh, um, as you do so. Right, so subject of baptism, <coughs> who can be baptized? Well, adult catechumens can be uh, baptized. Catechumen, uh, if you're familiar with the, uh, the with that phrase, if you're not, uh, it means that people who are learning, right? People who are learning about the faith uh, and has gone through catechism. Uh, so catechumens go through catechisms. Catechisms are basically like baptism class, but it's more like a Q&A kind of a thing. This, okay, do you understand what it means by God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? And then here's the answer. Do you know what this means? And that is the answer. That is what uh, uh, catechism means. So adult catechumens are to undergo initiation into Christian faith and life that should dispose them to receive the gift of God in baptism, in confirmation, and in the Eucharist. But then you ask about uh, we'll talk about uh, right. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about about it here about the unbaptized dead. What if you uh, die while being a catechumen? So those who die for the faith, that is, if you are martyred for the faith, or those who are catechumens, so while you are still going through baptism class, and all those who, without knowing of the church but acting under the inspiration of grace, those who seek God sincerely and strive to fulfill His will can be saved even if they have not been baptized. So uh, if you die before uh, baptism, then uh, the Lord will still look favorably upon your intention. Uh, unbaptized believers who suffer death for the sake of the faith are also saved. This is known as baptism of blood. Now, uh, the, another group of people who are to be baptized are infants. Uh, this is known as the practice of infant baptism. So the practice of infant baptism, they say, enjoys uh, explicit testimony from the 2nd century on. So very early on in the, um, in the, in the, in the history of the church, we already have evidence from the church fathers that the uh, that the church already uh, practiced infant baptism. So this goes uh, all the way back, maybe even to the apostolic teaching, uh, preaching, uh, to the times of the apostles where infants may have been baptized because we have uh, evidence in the New Testament uh, that their whole households received baptism. And uh, it is without doubt that in a large household uh, there will be uh, infants 
in that household and when the whole household received baptism the argument is that surely then the infants themselves were also uh, may have also been baptized Acts chapter uh, 16 uh, for example we have uh, Acts chapter 16 verse uh, 15 uh, this is about the household of Lydia uh, Lydia was at Philippi listening to the preaching of Paul and after she was baptized and her household as well she urged us saying uh, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord come to my house and stay uh, the important point is that after she was baptized and her household as well not only was Lydia's uh, household baptized uh, f following uh, following Lydia's conversion Paul and Silas were thrown into prison and in prison <coughs> there were as they were singing hymns at night uh, there was an earthquake and all the doors were swung open and the Philippian jailer thought that the prisoners have escaped and was attempting suicide and Paul and Silas stopped him and uh, he asked them, Sir, what must we, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And uh, Paul and Silas said, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds, and he was baptized at once, he and all his family. So here, uh, those who uh, those who uh, 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 say that the Bible attests to infant baptism would come to uh, verses such as this to talk about household baptism. Surely when you baptize the entire household, you would also baptize uh, infants. Chapter uh, 18 verse 8 uh, Crispus, who is the ruler of the synagogue at Corinth, having believed in the Lord together with his entire household, and many of the Corinthians hearing Paul believed and were baptized. First uh, Corinthians chapter one verse sixteen. First uh, Corinthians chapter one verse sixteen. When some say, "I follow Paul," "I follow Apollos," "I follow Cephas," "I follow Paul," he or he, he Paul asks. Were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one may say that you were baptized in my name. I did baptize also the household of Stephanas. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. So Paul says that he baptized the household of Stephanas. Would he not also baptize the infant member of the infant members of that household? Right. So uh, you ask the question. Why baptize the infants? What would be the effect of uh, that baptism? Would that be new birth in the Holy Spirit? Is that what it is about? Or is it purification from sins? Well, from what sin do they were they purified from? What would be the effects of infant baptism? Because the Roman Catholic says that the effects of baptism is purification from sins. And if we take the view that infants uh, do not sin or are not accountable for their sins, then <clears throat> from why, are, why do they require purification? The answer to that question, uh, according to this view, is that infants are baptized to wash them from original sin. So original sin <clears throat> is this uh, doctrine that we not only inherit uh, sin, the sinful nature from uh, Adam, we also inherit his guilt. So uh, the guilt that Adam bore as a result of his sin uh, are imputed to us as well. So that collectively as humanity, we are guilty before the Lord whether or not we personally sin against God or not. Uh, it is not uh, because of our personal sin alone that we are condemned. Rather, we bear the responsibility for Adam's sin. And so therefore, uh, we are guilty before the Lord at birth because we uh, inherit 
original sin from Adam and infant baptism then in that baptism uh, the infants are washed from original sin and since they are washed from original sin then uh, they are no longer guilty of Adam's sin and they are not responsible for their own personal sin all right so because they're incapable of personal sin so and <coughs> they are washed from original sin then they qualify to go to heaven that is the idea <coughs> now baptism is the sacrament of faith but it is only within faith of the church that each of the faithful uh, can believe so you can only um, <coughs> uh, 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 be baptized uh, by uh, uh, it, yeah, yeah, it, it, baptism requires faith <clears throat> but here uh, the question is for infants where is the faith right people would like to ask where is the faith if baptism requires faith where is the faith <clears throat> so the Roman Catholic Church responded that for infants it is not personal faith uh, rather it is the faith of the church uh, it is the faith of the church uh, that that is why you you come to faith if it's not because of the faith of the church you would not have believed so it is because of the faith or the strength of the faith of the church uh, the infant can be baptized <coughs> now what about unbaptized infants now if you are an unbaptized adult but you uh, intend to be baptized then you are saved as well but what about infants who die uh, unbaptized so uh, there was no good solution to this question uh, because really the doctrine painted itself to into into a corner in in my opinion uh, so the infant although not guilty of personal sins he nonetheless is guilty of Adam's sin and that necessitated baptism so since um, since he, the infant is not free from original sin and died before uh, baptism then he remains guilty of Adam's sin and so the child is said to be in limbus uh, in limbo, uh, the limbus infantium. So when we say that <coughs> we are in limbo, actually that comes from the Latin limbus infantium that refers to what happened to an infant uh, who died uh, unbaptized. The child is placed in limbo. So we do not know. And this doctrine <coughs> was uh, abolished in 2006 by Pope Benedict the 16th all right so this doctrine is no longer official doctrine of the church now uh, the church merely says we don't know God will judge so we are not certain that they are placed in limbo so that um, that uh, doctrine has since been abolished now on mode of baptism uh, how do Roman Catholics practice uh, baptism so the essential rite of baptism consists of immersing the candidate in water or pouring water on his head while pronouncing the invocation of the most holy trinity the father the son and the holy spirit so either way will work <coughs> immersion or pouring water on the head while invocating <coughs> uh, the most holy trinity who can baptize the ordinary ministers of baptism are the bishop and priest and in the latin church uh, which we generally call the, uh, the the roman catholic church uh, the deacons are also qualified to 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 baptize all right and in case of necessity actually anyone can baptize provided that he have the intention of doing that which the church does and provided that he pours water on the candidate's head while saying i baptize you in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit so for example let's just say 
you are <coughs> um, um, uh, on your deathbed in the hospital and uh, <coughs> the priest is stuck in the traffic jam and you know that you may only you you don't have um, enough time to wait for the to the, the priest to come and so you call the doctor in and you ask the doctor doctor are you a Christian <coughs> and the doctor says no I'm not a Christian uh, well can you baptize me how do I baptize you you say I baptize you you pour water on my head and say I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and the doctor whether he's a believer or not doesn't matter and if you follow the instruction to baptize uh, the patient <coughs> with water in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, then that baptism is also valid. So in cases of emergency, say in times of war, uh, uh, situations like that, where you don't have access to the priest or even to any Christian, uh, even a non-Christian can baptize you and uh, you uh, and that baptism will be recognized as valid. So that is the uh, Roman Catholic view on baptism. It is a sacramental view. It is very important because it is by which you are saved. Uh, it is actually saving grace, baptismal regeneration. And if you are not baptized and you're not in the process of uh, being baptized or that you have or that you, you had, or that the idea of baptism has not crept up in your mind then you cannot be saved to be saved all right <clears throat> next view that we want to look at is the Lutheran view the Lutheran view now uh, the for Lutherans the meaning of baptism is again saving grace so baptism is a means through which God imparts saving grace by creating and or strengthening the gift of faith in a uh, person's heart. <clears throat> so um, baptism itself can create faith. So if you don't already have faith, uh, if you don't have faith, then uh, um, such as an infant, so say an infant cannot place his faith in God, uh, but baptism will create that faith uh, in that person, in that, in, that, in that child. Or strengthening of faith, uh, also known as visible gospel. It is a visible gospel. So gospel can be through preaching or through action. So this is, the baptism is the preaching of the gospel, but in, but acted out, right? the acting out of the message of the gospel. So the message of the gospel can be preached all right, using words uh, or it can be acted out uh, through baptism. So uh, if you already have faith, then um, baptism will strengthen that faith. That is why it is saving grace. Now the effects of uh, baptism is Again, wash from original sin and regeneration. It is the same uh, in this sense with the Roman Catholics. But uh, what is the argument of this particular um, of of, uh, of this particular doctrine? So uh, Martin Luther focuses on God's grace. Everything that happens is by the grace of God alone. Uh, we play no part. On, on our salvation, it is God who graciously washed away our original sin without any help or cooperation on the part of human beings. So because of that, uh, uh, you do not require faith first because uh, salvation is not by faith. Salvation is by grace through faith right you, you can tell you know the difference salvation is not by faith but salvation is by grace through faith faith is the channel through which you are saved but primarily the agent the agent of uh of salvation is grace 
So grace is up to God to give. And if God were to give you grace, then you are saved. And that grace will create or strengthen the, uh, your faith. So uh, that, therefore, the washing away of one's original sin in the water of baptism is, does not require any help or cooperation on the part of uh, human beings. And also, uh, on the matter of salvation, Baptism is necessary, but not absolutely necessary for salvation. What that means is that um, uh, it is necessary for salvation, but uh, meaning that you cannot deny baptism. So if you say that you believe in Jesus, and then you say, I don't want to receive baptism, then you are not saved. Okay, You cannot say, I believe in Jesus, but I don't want to be baptized. In the eyes of the Lutheran, such a person is not saved. Uh, this is different from <clears throat> a person who, have not, who does not reject baptism, but hasn't had the opportunity uh, for baptism, especially if the church doesn't baptize on the spot, have uh, maybe a annual or uh, once in two years kind of a, a baptismal event, and if you die before then, you are saved. So uh, it is necessary for salvation, but not absolutely necessary. That is to say, you cannot reject baptism when offered or when taught to you. If you do that, then you are not saved. All right. Uh, who can uh, be baptized? <clears throat> Adults who have come to faith in Christ. Adults who have come to faith in Christ uh, should be baptized. That one is uncontroversial. Uh, but infant baptism, uh, how is this different from the Roman Catholic view? On infant baptism, uh, there are two views. One view is that at baptism, God creates faith in the heart of the infant. So who says that infants cannot uh, uh, place their faith in, in Christ? If God wants that baby to place uh, this trust in Jesus, then God can do that because, again, it is by grace. So God graciously, through the waters of baptism that is bound up in the Word, creates faith in the heart of the infant. Uh, or it could be the vicarious faith of either the parents or that of the church. Now, you may complain and say, wait a minute, uh, why should the waters of baptism be able, whether it's bound up with the word or not, how does it uh, create faith in the heart of anyone at all, uh, uh, infants or adults? The answer to that question, the Lutherans would say, is that uh, it is the same as preaching the word of God, preaching the gospel with words. When we preach with words, what happened? Faith is created or strengthened in the person. And why does that happen? Because it is God, by His grace, that creates that faith uh, in your heart. So, by grace, God creates faith in your heart through the preaching of the gospel. So, likewise, uh, God, by His grace, creates faith in your heart through the enacting of the uh, uh, the acting out of the visible gospel uh, through the uh, through baptism, right? So baptism is equivalent to uh, preaching the gospel. God works in the same way. Now, um, on the mode of baptism, there are three modes that are acceptable. <coughs> um, uh, at least three that are mentioned. Uh, basically, the Lutherans are not concerned about uh, the manner of baptism, whether it's immersion or pouring or, or sprinkling. This does not determine whether a baptism is valid. Uh, rather, what is important are two things, the Word of God and the element. And the element here is water. So for Lutheranism, it is always uh, these two uh, things that are important, the Word and the element. So for baptism, it is the word and water being the element, and if it is uh, the Lord's Supper, then it is the, the elements will be the bread and the wine that is bound up with the word of God. According to divine institution, uh, makes a valid 
baptism. So there you go, we have a, a view of baptism, or two views of baptism that are sacramental in nature, not just sacramental, but also that it is saving grace. Uh, that is what saving grace actually means. Saving grace, uh, baptismal regeneration, that may be very different from our own uh, view in the Brethren Assemblies about uh, baptism. Next week, we will be looking at uh, how the Reformed people and also how uh, people like us uh, view uh, this question of, of baptism. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, <clears throat> again, if there's any question, I don't see any question on the chat. Um, but if you do have, please uh, put it on the chat or you may want to ask live now. If just one at a time. Okay, that's um, Stephen. How would you interpret Mark chapter 16, verse 16 on Jesus' words? Uh, on the need for baptism for salvation. Let me read uh, Mark 16, verse 16, for everyone's uh, benefit here. It says, um, Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Well, my interpretation of this is that it is not scripture. So I do not view Mark chapter uh, 16, verse 9 to 20 as authentic uh, the word of God. Uh, I read them as for historical interest, but I do not read them as the word of God. Uh, if you read, uh, sorry, I better don't do. It. If you read your, if you open up your Bible and you go to uh, Mark chapter sixteen. Uh, usually, unless you're reading from the NKJV uh, or from the King James Version, if you're reading from the NIV or the ESV or NSV or any of these modern translations, you will see a footnote somewhere, all right, that says that uh, Mark chapter 16, verse 9 to 20 uh, are not found in the earliest, most reliable manuscripts. It is only found in much, much later uh, um, manuscripts that are less than reliable, uh, that traditionally made it into the King James Version, but upon scholarly scrutiny, uh, it doesn't stand up to scrutiny. So uh, uh, modern translations would sequester these verses away uh, to let you know that they don't think that this is the Word of God. Are you happy with that answer, by Ken? Okay. Anything else? Anyone? 